بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سبئهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Respected brothers, elders, esteemed scholars, sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله I just want to start with a question uh, Maybe I started with this question when I was in last time as well for a different cause out of those sitting here how many people intend to go back to the country of their forefathers hands up seriously not this you know i mean uh, the one one to, okay, say about four or five, four or five hands that I've seen, yeah? That means that the vast majority sitting here intend to live here, die here, get, nowadays even get buried here. And that means your children are going to grow up in this place as well. So that means that your children are also going to grow up here. Now, if that is the case, and you all know that from the time when we grew up, now the younger generation, the challenges are different. The challenges in many forms are, are greater. So, if you intend to stay here, then you need to invest in the future of your children. And if you're not going to invest in the future of your children, then I am seriously speaking, this is, this is you really need to then think about migrating. Because you and I have an obligation to our subsequent generations. Just because you don't get fatwas flying out here, there, listen. And because it's somewhat abstract, just because you don't get fatwas that you need to make institutes, you need to safeguard the iman of your children. That doesn't mean that the obligation is not on your shoulders and my shoulders. You know the new challenges our children have? And if you don't, then you really need to migrate. If you don't, then you need to go. They say, okay, let me ask you a question. What is the biggest challenge that our children have? The biggest challenge. Quickly just, huh? Internet. Something more direct to them, like, anybody? Sorry? Lack of youth facility. Yeah, lack of youth facility, okay. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, yes. TikTok. <laughs> Don't say that, man. <laughs> okay. Identity. Identity. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, but the biggest danger that they have directly affecting their belief is doubts in their religion. There was a time we didn't have these issues. People say, oh, the biggest problem that we have is LGBTQ. That is not the biggest Q. That is a issue. But the biggest issue that we have today is people who have doubts regarding their religion. And one of the main reasons for this is that we don't have the facility for the youth. We don't have the places where our children can feel comfortable, where the Iman grows. So generally what do we do by the age of 12? We take our children out of Maktab 12, 13. The most challenging part of their life we take our children out of the madarsa. 
And then when they want to learn about Islam, where do they go? They go to the internet. So you go on the TED talk and you have some lady talking about the fact that, oh, there's no hijab in the Quran. There's not a verse in the Quran about hijab. And now you're young, you're exp you know, impressionable. And you start thinking, yeah, maybe there is not. And then you have an issue with LGBTQ and it's all love. Life is all love. Live and let live. So you go onto the internet and you check and you find somebody very articulate, sounds very academic and says, Oh, the story of Lut was all about rape. And because you have no real people to recourse to, you have no institutes, you get confused. And look, I'm looking at the audience here now. Actually, the audience here is most of them, half of them are quite an age. You must likely pass that phase. But what about our future generations? What is going to happen to our future generations? And I, I say this again, while I'm discussing this today. I said, migration never stands still. Remember this, migration never stands still. You migrate to a place and you think you've done a good move and we are happy that most of us are generally quite happy that our parents moved here. But what about the next generation? Don't you, is there any obligation upon you and I to think what's going to happen to the next generation? Our children, the iman of our children. What's going to happen? And this is why brothers, and sisters, we need to invest in our tomorrow. Invest in the tomorrow of our children. I am serious. If you are going to stay in this country, then you need to invest. Otherwise, if all you're doing is hoarding or looking for a dunya with prosperity and now, you know, you get this mentality that, oh, Maulvi's got no money anyway. That's why he doesn't like dunya. Now, Molvi likes dunya, but just hoarding because you live in Aston, you live in Smithwick, and now the greatest goal in life is to move to Sam Coalfield or to move to Sully Hull. Ya Habibi, Wallahi, let me tell you, well, let me tell you, there will be a day in your life. There will be, a, if you have that opportunity, there will be a day in your life, you will look over your shoulder and you will think, what did I invest for my akhirah? If you have that opportunity. And many will not even have that opportunity. You know, Mulana was speaking about our elders. Our elders, his father, Rahmatullah Alayhi, and all the elders, they built these masajid. They invested for you and I. The vast majority of these people couldn't even string two words of English. But they built these masjid, they built the, the, the tomorrow for us. I am telling you, none of us could do this. When they did, none of us could do this. None of us could walk three miles. I used to see my father walk every single day, three miles to the masjid, clean the masjid, stray, sometimes stray from Dhuhr to Isha, because he would have to walk back. That's what they did. Me and you, are, we can give money. Alhamdulillah, times change. We can give money, but sweat and blood? No. That's why when you see a footballer like, you know, Saudi Mane, and he cleans the toilet, why does he you think he cleans the toilet? You and I don't clean the toilet. Because he still has the spirit that our forefathers had. They're ready to get their hands dirty. You're earning millions every year. But that soul, that spirit is gone. That spirit is gone. So brothers and sisters, you know, masjid is something amazing. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, 
ان اول بيت وضع لناس للذي ببكه مباركا وهدى للعالمين that the first masjid which was created for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was in Bakka. Bakka is the old name. It had two qualities. What were these two qualities? It was Mubarak, it had Baraka which emanated from it. And guidance lil alameen. It's really interesting when Allah speaks about this first house, Allah says, Wudhi alinas. It was established for humanity. Allah does not say wudhi alil mu'mineen. Allah says wudhi alil nas. We know that to the haram, non-Muslims can't even go to the haram. But the khayr which emanated from this masjid, all of humanity benefited. Because this masjid has a link with the believers. How does it have a link with the believers? Allah when He defines you and me and this ummah, what does He say? He says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلْنَاسِ You are the best of people. When? Condition. When are you the best of people? When humanity sees your khair. When humanity sees your good of a believer, then you are the best of ummahs. See our link with this first house, which was created in Mecca, which was, you know, you know, you see the Kaaba today, yeah? Kaaba is quite large. You know when the Kaaba was first created? It was nothing like this. It barely exceeded the head of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, Ismail alayhi salatu It had no roof. So this house, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, but has no roof. It was very, very simple. But you know what Allah defines two characteristics in this house? Barakah. Everybody around it felt the barakah. Everybody around it attained guidance from it. And if you want to see a model, a model of that house, then you look at Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How big was Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Anybody tell me here? I won't take your time up. 30 by 35 meters. That's the entire Masjid, Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 30 meters by 35 meters. No fancy carpet. When you did sajda, the pebbles stuck to your forehead. The ceiling barely exceeded the heads of those who prayed in it. No chandelier. When Omar anhu was stabbed, Abu Lulu hid at the front of the masjid. Nobody saw him. No chandelier, no light. But look at the barakah. Look at the guidance. People left from that small masjid and spread Islam all the way to the Caucasus, all the way into North Africa, all the way to the borders of Mongolia. Why? Because people had a soul. You know, I was uh, after Maghrib, sometimes I go for a walk. So I, I went for a walk yesterday. I was on Hansworth Road and somebody parked up, well, a friend of mine, and he met me and then he started complaining about his masjid. He said to me, you know, Sheikh, our ah, masjid. Now he's, mashallah, you don't know him. He's, he's a reformed gangster. Yeah, but alhamdulillah, he's always in a masjid. May Allah reward him. He goes, he's got 300,000 pounds in the masjid. But they don't know what to do with the money. I mean, in his definition, I'm, I don't take this bad. He was saying, they're a bunch of Pakistani yardies. And they got the money there and they don't know what to do with it. See, this is the thing. Now I know that if this masjid had the money and had the resources, that they would invest in your tomorrow. They would invest in people. You see the activities, you see how much fikr that Mullah Abdul Subhan Sahib has, you see his team. But this is the problem, you know, all the, uh, generally, all the masjids which have the millions just lay in a bank account and all the masjids which want to do something have nothing in their account. Brothers and sisters, wallahi, we need to change our, uh, the way that we perceive reality. 
invest in people, invest in places which will be a source of khair and guidance for your children tomorrow. That's what you need to do. You know, we're still in that mentality, you know, that mentality we say, carpet. Masjid's already got carpet. They say carpet, we're ready to give a carpet. Dome. We need to raise 60,000 pounds for a dome. Everybody puts their hands up, I'll give 60,000 pounds for a minaret. Everybody gives the money for a minaret. Ask the very same people, we want you to give, pay your imam 30,000 pounds. Employ two good imams, 30,000 pounds each, who will interact with the children, who will bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who will lead the salah, who will increase people's iman. No, I don't want to do that. There, no, why are we going to pay Imam Sab 30,000 pounds for? Why are we going to pay a more 30,000 pounds? You know, honestly, honestly, don't take my words bad, but you know, if you ever heard my talks, they are quite straight anyway. So, you know, we're an element, we have a lot of hypocrisy within us, wallahi. On one hand, we say the most important thing is Iman and Islam and the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the other hand, this is the last thing that we invest in. The last thing that you invest in. You invest 30, 40,000 in your weddings. You'll have your Lamborghinis and your Porsches outside Bachar Palace, outside Royal Suite. You'll have them all there. You'll blow it for one day. For one day. What about investing in your Akhirah? What about investing in your future children? In our children what about getting the best people you know we run a darloom we run a madarsa mashallah mullah abdul subhan's brother mona saif qualified this year his sister-in-law qualified two years ago and you know the full-time alami course that we have i always say we get the worst students honestly by, by the end of the year one, either they drop out or they turn it around. They have amazing abilities, wallahi. But they, you look at the GCSE results, lowest GCSE results. And then they think, hey, this guy is worthless. What's he going to do with his life? He ain't going to become no doctor. He ain't going to become an engineer. Let's put him, and then the near, yeah? Then you're near. Let's give him for the sake of Allah. Like you're doing, mashallah, umma, great. And you are, may Allah reward you even for doing that. At least it came to your mind. And then they come to the Alamiya course, and anybody who has ever done the Alamiya course knows it's a tough course. Go right now, go right, go tomorrow, go tomorrow to a sufa and check the guys who are there doing the part time Alamiya course, the nine years. Because we're having exams, everybody is there now. Go and see the kind of people that we have doing the part, the part time Alamiya course. They're all professionals, they're doctors, etc. Ask them how tough just the part time Alamiya course is, let alone the full time Alamiya. But the thing is that what we invest for Allah, honestly, is the least or the thing which is not of great value because we value the dunya and we don't value the akhirah. And brothers, I'm going to come back to that statement I made earlier on. But let me, before I move on to that, you know, last, last week is funny because I've been, I've been saying to the, uh, the teachers in the Sufa, I've been saying, I'm going to, I was a bit joking, but I've been saying, I'm going to turn a Sufa into a masjid. They said, why, Sheikh? I said, because you know, madrasas, after the principal dies, they all fall apart. You look at all the big madrasas, at least a masjid, no matter what happens, it remains. Even if the committee have an ikhtilaf, salah still carries on. And it remains until the day of judgment. And this is why brothers and sisters, wallah, you know, investing in a masjid, which is vibrant, which is good for the community, there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. So this is why we need to invest in our masajid. We need to invest in these projects. Just not your money only, brothers and sisters. Your time, your effort, your sweat. In the time 
of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there was, as related by Imam Bukhari, there was this lady. She was a slave girl. Her name was Ummi Mihjan. Nobody has mentioned what her real name was, but her, her name was a kunia was Ummi Mihjan. So what did Ummi Mihjan do? Ummi Mihjan was a slave girl, and what happened is that one of the girls of the family that she was a slave of, she had this beautiful red brocade which had some you know, expensive stones on it. So one day what happened is that a eagle-like bird, a kite, came and it snatched it. And it took it away. So the girl wakes up. Umar Mahshin seen this. The girl wakes up and she realizes it's gone. So they look around frantically and then who do they blame? They will normally blame the, you know, the weak one. So they went up to Mu'min Mahjan and the narration is a Bukhari narration. They searched her to the degree they even searched her private part. Whilst this is all going on, the kite comes, it flies by and it drops the scarf. And they realize then the girl, she hadn't taken it. So they feel bad. So now what they do is that they free her. So Umay Mehjan had heard that there is a man called Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you can go to this person. And even if you're a nobody, he will respect you and give you Issa. Because in those days, if you were born a slave, you lived a slave, you died a slave. You had no aspirations in life. So Umay Mahjan goes to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu sees that this woman's got nothing. So he gives her residence in the masjid. She stays in masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what was the duty of this woman? What was the duty of Umay Mahjan? She used to clean the masjid. That's it. Clean the masjid. She couldn't do anything else. So one day the Messenger of Allah comes into the masjid and he asks, he said, where's Umay Mahjan? I haven't seen her for a few days. So they say, oh Messenger of Allah, she died, she passed away. So the Messenger of Allah said, why didn't you tell me? They said, because she passed away, we didn't want to disturb you. The narration mentions it was as though they didn't regard her as very significant. She wasn't very important. So the, look at this. Firstly, look at this. I want to ask you a question. When have you ever last walked into your masjid or your workplace and noticed the cleaner? Notice the cleaner. The Messenger of Allah even noticed that the cleaner was missing in the masjid. So the Prophet said, he got angry. He said, you should have informed her. But why did they inform him? Because she wasn't a muhajirun. She wasn't from the Ansar. She didn't give big donations or big mashwaras or big consultation. She was an ex-slave girl. So the Prophet Sallallahu now went, he said, show me where her grave is. And Wallahi, every time I go to Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi I sit in the courtyard and I, and, and I envisage what happened. Because Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is here and Jannat al-Baqi is here. And I, and I envisage how the Messenger of Allah would have got up, got up from the Masjid and then he would have walked to Jannat al-Baqi. And he said, show me where her grave is. They said, oh Messenger of Allah, this is her grave. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed the Janazah Salah again. For nobody else, Wallahi do I know that the Messenger of Allah did it in this manner besides this African lady. What did she do? She cleaned the masjid. The Messenger of Allah was showing you and I. Not everybody has to give a khutbah. Not everybody has to be imam. But you're all a part of this ummah. You clean the masjid and this is your status by Allah. What about if you build a masjid? What about if you lead a masjid? What about if you contribute to a masjid? 
What is your status? So brothers and sisters, I'm going to leave you with this statement. There will be a day in your life, there will be a day in your life, if you are fortunate enough, that the doctor will tell you, that you have six months to live. You got six months. You spent 60, 70 years, now you got six months. You got terminal cancer. You got a brain tumor. You get heart failure. Your kidneys are packing up. Wallahi, I swear by Allah, I can give you wallahi examples which happened two days ago. This guy always opposed some work, the work of Dean, which we were involved in, always. And two days he sent a message because he's unwell. The doctor said, you got few days left. You will look over your 60 years and I swear by Allah, your life, your 60 years will be crystal clear. Crystal clear. You will look back and you will say, you will, your life today, you're, me and you are in the rat race, we've got no time. You know what they say the biggest regret people have? And these are non-Muslims, non-Muslims. You know what the biggest regret they have? The biggest regret people have is that we wish non-Muslims, we wish we had spent more time with those that we really mattered and we loved. We wish we had spent more time with our wife, with our children, with our parents, with our siblings. Because it's clear now. You know you've got six months left. You know what the second biggest regret is? That we wish that we had expressed our love for those that really mattered. I wish I had told my mother what she meant to me. I wish I told my father what he really meant to me. I wish I told my husband, I wish I told my children what they meant to me. You know what they say? They say the bitterest tears. The bitterest tears are those which are shed on graves for words unsaid and deeds undone. The bitterest tears are those which are shed on graves for words unsaid. Your mum passes away. You never showed affection to your mum. Never. And now your mum is gone from this dunya. And you stand on your mum's grave. And you say to your mum, Mum, I wish I could tell you now what you really meant to me. You go to your dad's grave and for deeds undone, you go to your dad's grave and you say to your dad, Dad, if only you could come back to this dunya for one more day, one day, you would see how I did your khidmah. You would see what an obedient child I was. You know what the third biggest regret they have? Listen to this one, brothers. I wish I had worked less. A dying man <laughs> never says, I wish I'd worked more. I wish I had worked less. And for a believer, for a believer, I wish I had worked less so I could have connected with Allah. I could have connected with my family. So brothers, the examples I'm giving you are not Muslims, I'm giving you non-Muslims. That nobody dying says, I wish I'd worked more. That day will come to you and I. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, on the day of judgment, man will say, return me to the dunya. فَأَصَدَّكَ فَأَقُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ What does he say? Look at it, subhanAllah. Man says, Allah send me to the world. Does he say, so I can pray more salah? Does he say, Allah send me to the dunya so I can do more zakat, hajj? Allah says, he'll say, Allah send me back to the dunya so I can do a bit more sadaqah. Allah says it. I ain't saying it. 
Allah records it in the Quran because man will see the virtue of sadaqah. So brothers and sisters, we have this opportunity now. In this world, we have the opportunity to do something worthwhile, to leave a legacy, to leave a sadqa jariya, to make the future of our children. I swear by Allah, if you do that, wallahi, you will live a happy existence and you will live a happy hereafter. So I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in your wealth and your health, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our pious, children pious, that Allah make us a source of sadqa jariya for our parents, Allah make our children a source of sadqa jariya for us. You know, Imam Shafi rahmatullah alayhi said, when man dies, either his evil lives on or his good lives on. They asked him how? He said his evil lives on in the form of his children. Or his good lives on in the form of his children. The biggest sadqa jariya you and I have, brothers and sisters, is our awlad and our children. If we work for the iman of our children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put great barakah in our wealth and our health. And then finally I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make Mulana's masjid, this masjid, a masjid which is on the model of Masjid Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That barakah comes out of it and guidance comes out of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the khlas. Zakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.